Today I am going to talk about the worrisome neck mass, evaluation of neck mass in adults. I am Eric Paulo de la Cruz, I am an ENT and head and neck surgeon. So when a patient comes to you in your clinic with a neck mass, one thing that worries them at the back of their heads, even if you don't ask them, is Doc, is this neck mass benign or malignant? So in order for us to answer this question, we should work the patient up. So today I am going to talk about how to approach a neck mass in adults. So here are eight ways to approach the worrisome neck mass. Most of the materials I have here in my talk comes from the clinical practice guidelines in evaluating adult neck masses made by the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery released back in 2017. This is actually very helpful in dealing with neck masses and you can actually download this for free. Just go over to entnet.org and download the said CPG. First is determine the type of mass the patient has. So among the neck masses in adults, the most common types are thyroid masses, submandibular gland masses, subcutaneous masses, lymph neck nodes, and others, which are really not that common. Regardless of which type the neck mass of the patients belongs to, it's still the same approach that I will discuss in this lecture. Let's discuss briefly all of these type of neck masses. So first is the thyroid mass. How do we know if the neck mass comes from the thyroid? First, it is midline or paramidline. It is in the center, it's not on the side, so it's usually in the center. That's where the thyroid is and it elevates on swallowing. So you just have to ask the patient to swallow in order to know if it's really from the thyroid. So take a look at this example. Okay, when you ask the patient to swallow, the mass also elevates. It has something to do with the thyroid and its attachment to the trachea and the trachea it elevates during swallowing. Thus, if there's a mass in the thyroid and it's attached to the trachea, it also elevates. The rate of cancer in thyroid masses is around 5 to 15 percent, usually around 4 percent in females and around 8 percent in males on the average. And the following will tell you that it can be worrisome. First, if its size is around 4 centimeters or larger. It has firmness, it has fixation to adjacent tissue, and it has a uh, associated lymphadenopathy, usually in the levels of 2, 3, and 4. Now let's go on to submandibular gland mass. So first, we should locate where the submandibular gland is. The submandibular gland usually is located in a depression lateral to the suprahyoid midline. So if this is the suprahyoid midline, there's a depression when you try to run your fingers going to the side and just lateral to that depression it is the submandibular gland it is slightly anterior to the angle of the jaw this is the angle it's over here so if you take a look at this picture this is the submandibular gland and there's another one on the left so if you can see there is a ridge over here you can find the submandibular gland there this is the submandibular gland and this is the ridge that goes before the depression it is formed by the anterior digastric muscle so in this picture this is the ridge and this is the ridge over here so if there's a mass it should be lateral to that ridge like this one so we know that this is indeed coming from the submandibular gland Subcutaneous masses are also common in adult population. So usually, it is an epidermoid cyst from the pilosebaceous follicles. It is usually movable and tethered to the skin. So when you try to move it, it moves with the skin. And some will have a visible punctum. Next are neck lymph nodes. Neck lymph nodes can be anywhere in the neck. It is usually separate or underneath the skin compared to subcutaneous masses. It usually indicates that there is a primary somewhere in the neck because neck lymph nodes are usually offshoots of an infection or a neoplasm in the neck. So in this example, we have here lymph nodes. These neck lymph nodes are not disease by itself. These are just offshoots of a primary somewhere in the head and neck. So in this case, this is a floor of mouth cancer. Number two, 
Know if the mass is infectious. In children, neck masses are usually infectious. But in adults, usually it's more neoplastic than infectious and it is usually malignant. There is an adage that says, a neck mass in the adult patient should be considered malignant until proven otherwise. So if it's infectious, prescribe antibiotics if only there are signs of infections, which are the classic warm, erythema, swelling, tenderness to palpation. And also, prescribe antibiotics only if the mass appears after an upper respiratory tract infection, a dental problem, or insect bites. However, you should reassess the mass after two weeks. The third is what we call the two weeks rule. Suspect malignancy in any adult neck mass that does not resolve within two weeks or of uncertain duration, especially if the mass has the following characteristics. It is fixated to adjacent tissue, it has a firm consistency, it has a size of 1.5 centimeters, and it has already ulceration of the overlying skin. Take a look at this example. So we have a neck mass which already ulcerated the skin and it is more than 1.5 cm. This is an ulcerated neck node. When we're talking about cystic masses, just like in this picture, do not assume that it is benign. In fact, up to 62% of head and neck cancers are cystic in nature, especially those HPV-related squamous cell carcinoma of the aerodigestive tract. 80% of cystic masses is cancerous for patients 40 years old and above, according to studies. Special mention in this two weeks rule are TB adenitis. So these are TB infected lymph nodes. And usually you can diagnose this if in the history there is a close contact of a TB patient, chest x-ray, but more importantly, a PPD test. So this is an example of a TB adenitis. Some may have erythematous skin overlying it, but some don't. So TB adenitis can be there for more than two weeks. Some may have it for a year or so. The next special mention is infectious mononucleosis. Infectious mononucleosis presents as a neck mass, but usually they have a history of a sore throat. Sometimes it is an exudative tonsillitis. And there are posterior neck masses on level 5 in 76% of patients. It is usually behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle and in literature, they say it is bilateral. One distinguishing feature of infectious mononucleosis is the appearance of an ampicillin or an amoxicillin rash. So when you give patients antibiotics like amoxicillin or ampicillin for an infection, they will have a rash and this will clinch the diagnosis of infectious mononucleosis. Of course, the best test for infectious mononucleosis are antibody tests for Epstein-Barr virus. And the neck mass in infectious mononucleosis is usually around 3 to 6 weeks. Number 5 concerns about lymph nodes. You should try to locate the primary of these lymph nodes. Lymph nodes must have come from somewhere. Again, in adults, it is malignant until proven otherwise. So again, we should review here the types of malignancy found in the head and neck. So the first are aerodigestive tract malignancies. So the aerodigestive tract includes the lips, the oral cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, the nasal cavity, and the nasopharynx. And the most common type is squamous cell carcinoma. Another type are endocrine malignancies, such as thyroid cancers and parathyroid cancers and another type of malignancy in the head and neck are skin cancers in the face odontogenic cancers in the maxilla and the mandible orbital cancers and lymphoma so we go back now to locating the primary of these lymph nodes so lymph node location can point to where the primary is this is where the importance of knowing the neck lymph node levels so in the neck we have these lymph node levels so we have level one above the hyoid and below the mandible. Level 2 is in the upper one-third of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Level 3 in the middle third and level 4 in the lower third. Level 5 lymph nodes are found primarily behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Level 6 is everything in front of the sternocleidomastoid muscle but below the hyoid. So if you are presented with any lymph nodes, from levels 1 to 3, you should suspect that the primary must be in the lip or in the oral cavity. A patient presenting with a neck mass in the submental area. And true enough, this patient has a tongue cancer. 
When presented with lymph nodes in the levels 2 to 4, usually the primary should be located in the following areas. In the oropharynx, so that includes the tonsils, the base of the tongue, hypopharynx, larynx, especially if the patient has hoarseness or stridor, or the thyroid. This patient has level 3 and level 4 lymph nodes, and true enough, this is a case of a thyroid cancer with lymph node metastasis. When presented with level 4 lymph nodes alone, like this one, it is just above the clavicle. 50% of it comes from within the neck region. So either larynx, thyroid, hypopharynx, but 50% comes from below the clavicle. It can be from the chest or from a GI tract. If found in the left, we call it the virtuous node. When presented with level 5 lymph nodes, usually it comes from the nasopharynx or in some thyroid cancers. So in this case, this is a case of a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. The patient presented primarily with a neck mass before experiencing nasal symptoms. Skin cancers has lymph nodes in any levels, especially melanoma. It can present anywhere. For example, in this patient, we have a pigmented lesion over here that proved to be cancerous. Patient had a level 2 lymph node. How about bilateral neck nodes? So if you are presented with a patient with bilateral neck nodes like this one, usually it comes from the nasopharynx, tongue base, or midline oral cavity. It has something to do with the area's bilateral lymph node drainage. Number six, do a CT scan. It is the best study for neck masses in an adult patient. You should request for a neck CT scan with contrast. A CT scan without contrast will not give you good information. So why do we choose CT scan? CT scan will localize and characterize the mass. If it's solid or cystic, it can assess for other non-palpable masses. You can actually locate the primary tumor while assessing the lymph node. And the CT scan can be used for future surgical planning. MRI with contrast is usually considered when we are dealing with tumors of the nasopharynx or tumors near the skull base, which includes a nasal cavity tumor or a sinonasal tumor. So this is an example of a tumor found in the right nasal cavity and this is a CT scan with contrast. So you'd assume that the tumor is just confined in the nasal cavity. But on MRI, you can see that the tumor already invaded the soft tissue near the orbit and also the skull base. So this gives you more information than this one. As long as it's near the skull base, MRI should be considered. If the patient has severe renal insufficiency with CT or MRI contrast, what do we request? So it is better to ask for a plain MRI rather than a plain CT because a plain CT will not give you additional information. How about ultrasound? Ultrasound is primarily used to evaluate for superficial tissues and this is very useful in evaluating thyroid, salivary glands, and lymph nodes. However, it doesn't really assess for the aerodigestive tract. Another use for the ultrasound is to guide you when you are doing your fine needle aspiration biopsy. Number seven is don't hesitate to do FNAB. You can do FNAB even in your clinics. FNAB or fine needle aspiration biopsy just like this one, has a high accuracy to clinch the diagnosis. It is very safe. There is no risk of a tumor seeding. There is a low risk even in vascular neck lesions. It is safe even with anticoagulation. And it is very okay to repeat the FNAB over and over again. We do not recommend open biopsy because open biopsies will result to a non-healing wound as well as two more seeding in the skin and in the neck. If diagnosis is not obtained the first time, you should repeat and repeat and repeat. And that's okay. However, at this point, we recommend that you will do ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration biopsy, especially in lesions which are cystic in nature. So in this case, we have a cystic thyroid nodule. You should do a biopsy, target the solid component or the wall of the cyst. And lastly, we recommend you to do it with a pathologist. That way, you'll already know if your FNAB is already adequate or not, and it will save time. Number eight is early referral to specialist. Time is of the essence when we're dealing with suspicious neck masses. Refer to a specialist who can do endoscopies which can visualize the aerodigestive tract better. If malignant neck masses are diagnosed later, the survival of patients is poorer. 
So in this example here, this is a graph of laryngeal cancer cases. So this plots the survival rate of the patients and the time from diagnosis. So if we diagnose the patients early and it is still in the localized state and those diagnosed late with regional disease, those diagnosed early has double the chances of survival than those diagnosed late. It only means that as physicians, as much as possible, we should avoid delays in the diagnosis of suspected neck masses because this will ultimately improve the chances of our patients surviving. So in summary, how to approach a neck mass? First is know the type of neck mass. Second, know if the neck mass is infectious. Third, follow the two weeks rule for malignant masses. Number four, know the exceptions to the two weeks rule. Number five, locate as much as possible the primary of lymph nodes. Six, do a CT scan with contrast. Seven, don't hesitate to do fine needle aspiration biopsy. And eight is early referral to specialist. That's the end of my talk. So thank you everyone. And if you have questions, you can email me or you can visit my website or even my Facebook page. Thank you.